there are certain things in life that determine our success, determine our ability, determine the opportunities that we will have. And, and one of those things, and I think we emphasize this more than anything else, is that of competency or skills or ability. You can think of, of your job. The more skills you have, the more valuable you are to your employer. And the greater your skills are, the greater that uh, chance that you might have some type of advancement. But I would argue that competency is not the greatest um, thing when we talk about our success and the potential that we have to be successful. Because competency can be learned. It, it can be received quickly and easily. For instance, if I apply for a job as a welder, I'm not going to get the job because I can't weld. I've never welded in my life. But that's a skill that I can learn in a few days, a few weeks. I'm not sure how long it would take me to learn how to weld. But to have a basic level of competency, it doesn't take very long to learn a skill. Whether you're talking about something like welding or, or learning how to, to, to uh, uh, work a computer program or maybe write a computer program or, or fix something mechanically, whatever that is, it doesn't take very long to learn a skill. So I would argue that your character is much more important in determining your success than your competency because it doesn't take very long to develop a skill, but it takes a long time to develop your character. And your character is who you are. See, they say when you are hiring someone, you should hire their character more than their competency. Because if you've got, you've worked with somebody who just everybody else in the workplace just doesn't like. Whether they're annoying, whether they're kind of shady and do things that everybody else is uncomfortable with. But that person is not going to get the advancement that everybody else is. Because their character gets in their way. And the character takes a long time to build it real quickly. It's easily to destroy your character, but your character can be um, what drives you forward. And there are many people that we can look to for character, and so we can be encouraged and inspired by them. And we've been looking at David's mighty men. And the fifth one we're going to look at is a guy by the name of Benaniah. Ben and I was a man of integrity. He served David as his king. And he shows us that ability provides opportunities, but character determines success. Now we first find Ben and I in 2 Samuel chapter 8, and he's identified as the captain of the bodyguard. Essentially, he is the leader of the secret service. That's how we would parallel today. He was in charge of making sure that David, the king, was kept safe. And he had a couple of groups that were under his leadership. But essentially, the guys that were under his leadership were mercenaries. They were there to protect David, to protect any threat that would come against David, and make sure that he was safe in any way, shape, or form. It's interesting that the, the, the uh, bodyguard for the king in this time period were typically composed of foreigners, of people who weren't part of that nationality. That way they, they wouldn't necessarily be as susceptible to supporting a coup should that arise. They didn't have national sides that they had allegiance to. But Benaniah was in charge of making sure that David was kept safe. In fact, there were a couple of times where he had to keep David safe from his own children. We find in 2 Samuel 15, Absalom tries to overthrow his father. Absalom is one of David's sons, very charismatic individual, has been going to the people and getting their support so that they are aligned with Absalom and no longer with David, to the point where Absalom gets so powerful that David is forced to flee his home for fear, because Absalom is getting ready to take over. And so in this moment, we see that Absalom and David go to war against each other, essentially, and they have a battle. And Benaniah is in a particular situation, that if he chooses the wrong side to align himself with, he is going to die. If he stays with David and Absalom wins, he's going to die. If he defects from David to go support Absalom and David wins, he's going to die. So essentially, he had to ask himself the question, 
Who am I willing to die for? Should he stay with David or should he flee? And he stayed with David. And again, we see that, that he has this ability. He has ability to put him in positions where he, be, he can be successful, but his character is what determines his success. And as the story goes, David regains power and regains the throne. And so ben and I, his allegiance and loyalty to David is rewarded. And he is kept safe. But then in, in 1 Kings, we find that another one of David's sons is causing some problems. Adonijah is, is basically claiming the throne. At this point, David is old, and his effectiveness and his ability to lead has been greatly diminished. He really can't lead anymore. And so Adonijah is his oldest son, and he says, well, I'm the oldest. I'm next in line to the throne, so I'm going to claim the throne as mine. So he called most of his brothers and a few other people and had a celebration to claim his kingship and ruler of Israel. And so he called a couple specific people. He called uh, uh, Abiathar, the priest, as a, as a spiritual representative. And then he called Joab, who was the commander of the army. He was under David, and he was the commander of the army. And he got those two guys in the room to claim that he would be king. Well, the problem is that's not what David wanted. That's not what David had issued would actually happen. And so there's this prophet named Nathan who eventually goes to David and tells him what's happening. Now, if you remember, Nathan is the prophet who confronts David when he has an affair with Bathsheba, and then David kills her husband to try to cover it up. Nathan is the one who confronts David on that sin. So Nathan has some type of rapport with David. He also has God's spirit and power with him. Because you can't confront someone like the king with an accusation like that unless you have God's power with you. So Nathan comes to David and he says, hey, this is what's happening. Well, David said, that's not what I want to happen. David had already promised the throne to another son, Solomon, who was the son of Bathsheba. So, so David got... Nathan, and he called, um, he called uh, uh, Zadok, the priest, and then he called Benaniah. And so, so what's interesting here is, is Adonijah called Joab and Abiathar. He called the military leader, and he called the priest. David called Benaniah, the military leader. He called Zadok, the priest, and then he called Nathan, the prophet. And, and so we have these three guys the prophet, the priest, and as the military leader, Ben and I would have functioned as the king. He, just the more political leader is the traditional office there. His son, Adonijah, neglected the prophet function of leadership. See, he had the military leader. He had the political leader in Joab. He had the priest. The priest is the one who speaks to people uh, or speaks to God on behalf of people. But the prophet is the one who speaks to the people on behalf of God. So comes and say, thus saith the Lord. So Adonijah wasn't necessarily in complete defiance to his father. The people that supported his claim as king were in open disobedience to David, but they weren't really loyal to him either. See, the, the prophet function, I think sometimes we forget and neglect we need to make sure that we hear from God. It's not enough for us just to have all this, this practical leadership. It's not enough for us just to have, have the ability to talk to God. We also need to hear from God. And so David did that in this moment, and he claimed Solomon as king. And here is Benaniah's response in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 36 and 37. He says, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my king, decree that it happen." And may the Lord be with Solomon as he has been with you, my king. And may he make Solomon's reign even greater than yours. So he basically says, David, this is what you said. I trust that you are a man of God. I trust that you're being faithful to God. So I am going to serve you in this capacity. That was what his allegiance was. And he did it. And Solomon became king. But what's interesting, we have Ben and I, who's the the, the military leader, he's in contrast with Joab, the other military leader. See, throughout Joab's life, 
He did things. He schemed and connived and stabbed people in the back and did things for personal ambition so that he could succeed. And for all accounts, he was very successful. He became the commander of the entire Israelite army. But yet we remember him for acts like this, where he does things that are a little shady. He sees David's getting a little old, so he goes and he backs up the next up-and-comer so he can be more successful. He's focused on his ability, not his character, which contrasts Benaniah. Because what happens in 1 Kings chapter 2? Joab realizes that he has made a mistake. He realizes that he backed the wrong person. Backing Adonijah was a mistake. And so he was moping around. And he was mad at God. And he goes into the tabernacle, enters a place called the sanctuary. And in the tabernacle, the sanctuary is a sacred place that only the priests can go. So for someone like Joab to go there was desecrating the tabernacle. And it was very disrespectful to God. So the tabernacle had to be purified. And so Solomon, who was king at this point, sent Benaniah to go and kill Joab. That is how his life ended. He was moping. He was mad. He was frustrated because his scheming had come to an end and he had to pay for his choices. He wasn't focused on the character side of things. So he had a building. At this point, Joab and uh, Benaniah had spent their entire lives having the same enemy, working together on the same team, but they came to this moment of decision, and Joab chose personal ambition. He chose to rely on his ability as opposed to his character, and he paid dearly for it. But Benaniah stayed true to his character throughout his entire life. And we find in 2 Samuel chapter 23, it lists him as one of the mighty men. And it says, There was Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from Kebez. He did many heroic deeds, which included killing two champions of, of Moab. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion into a pit and he killed it. Once armed only with a club, he killed an imposing Egyptian warrior armed with a spear. Benaniah wrenched the spear from his hand and killed him with it. So this is Benaniah's representation as one of the mighty men for King David. Now, he was not one of the three. There's kind of a, a, a different level that we have with David's mighty men. There was the three, and then there were 30 more. Benaniah was one of the 30. But when we look at, at Benaniah, he's the fifth person listed, the fifth mighty man listed. But we see that the other mighty men are listed more for general heroic deeds. This person stood against the Philistines, or this person killed this many in a single battle. But Benaniah is listed for specific things. It says he killed two champion warriors from Moab, which shows that he went against the best. It's not one of those things where he just was able to, to beat people that were uh, inferior to him. Benaniah went against the best. He didn't back down. He was loyal to what was needed to be done. Too many times I think we can choose the path of least resistance. And we can say, well, this is the easiest way, so we'll just coast on this way. Now, I don't think Benaniah just went looking for difficult times. But when a difficult situation approached him, he did not back down from it. And we can see with the mention of the lion, you know, there was this snowy day, he chased a lion into a pit, and he killed it. That seems a little crazy to us. If a lion goes down in a pit, I'm going to walk on by and hope I don't see the lion again. Right? Uh, but it was a problem. It was a situation. Now, there aren't lions in Palestine anymore, but there used to be. And lions are real dangerous. A 500-pound carnivore that's an apex predator, that's dangerous, particularly when you don't have modern weapons like we have today. But he saw a problem. He saw a situation that needed to be rectified. If that lion was allowed to live in that particular situation, it would wreak havoc and be very dangerous for people. But not only was it dangerous for him to attacked the lion. He also went into a pit. And in that, 
There's no escape. It was literally do or die in that moment. Only one would emerge from the pit. But then we also have that little fact that it was a snowy day. So it was slick. There was inclement weather that made it even more dangerous for Benaniah. Now, there are, um, are two books that are kind of written based on this subject by the author of Mark Batterson. He, uh, it's, one is called In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day, and the other one's called Chase the Lion. It, those are just great books. If you are interested in reading them, I encourage you to check them out. I have them. If you, if you want to borrow them, you'll be more than welcome to. But they challenge us because of Ben and I's courage. The fact that a a difficult situation presented itself, and he said, I am not going to back down. And then we have the situation where he encounters the Egyptian warrior with a spear, why Benaniah only has a club. Now we find uh, in, in 1 Samuel 13, Israel has a weapon manufacturing problem. It actually tells that there was no ironsmith in the land. What this means is that Israel's enemies had the advantage from a weapon standpoint. They had weapons that were superior, weapons that would help them and give them the advantage. But even though Ben and I was severely disadvantaged in this particular situation, he did not back down. In fact, he was victorious. We see that even though the situation was difficult, even though it wasn't great odds for him, he still did what was necessary. He still lived with courage. And this is tied to his character. He had ability, but it was his character that determined success. But then it gives a little bit more detail. It says, deeds like these made Ben and I as famous as the three, but he was not one of the three. He was more honored than the other 30, and David made him captain of the bodyguard. And then we have the three, the top three, and it's... it's, uh, Adino, Eleazar, and Shammah are the top three. And then we have Benaniah. He's more famous than the other 30, but he's not necessarily included in one of the three. But one of the things we learn about Benaniah is that success is not what drove him. Attention is not what drove him. If we're honest, we like to be noticed. We like people to recognize us for our gifts, our skills, our talents, our generosity, whatever that may be. But Ben and I wasn't concerned with that. And we can deduce that from the fact that he was captain of the bodyguard. He was in charge of the secret service. You know what the secret service likes? No excitement. When things are boring, the secret service is happy. When things are exciting is when they become dangerous, when they become uh, just situations that can get out of their control. But we like to be noticed. We need to recognize that. We need to not downplay that. But Ben and I did not seek the praise of other people. He didn't seek to be affirmed and get his self-worth by what others thought of him. And the reality is, Ben and I had the success had the success against the uh, warriors of Moab, against the lion, against the Egyptian, against other political rivals. But his point wasn't just to be better than them. Because in all reality, his skill set probably wasn't any better than a lot of other people. He was a mighty warrior. He was skilled. But when you get to a certain level, there's not much difference between this person and this person. And it's the character that separates them. You can think of any field, any area, any hobby. You know, there's some people that we might consider that are better than others, but it's the character that can really put people over the top. It's our ability that provides opportunities. We need a certain level of competency, but it's our character that determines success. But he wasn't defined by wanting to be known by anybody else. He wasn't part of the three He was part of the 30, which was still a high honor, but there was still another level that he didn't get to. But when we look at Ben and I, one of the things that stands out is he had an impressive record. There were a lot of things he did that were were noteworthy and worthwhile, but he had a spotless record. There are a lot of people in the Bible that we see, they did these great things, but they had some character flaws. They had some issues that just weren't exactly perfect. 
but he lived with honor and he was willing to serve in humble places. And again, I want to emphasize the fact that he was captain of the bodyguard. He chose to serve honorably, not for his own glory. Joab, on the other hand, was the commander of the Israelite army. Benaniah wasn't. He was in charge of the bodyguard, in charge of keeping David safe. But actually, when Joab fell off the deep end and tried to back Adonijah, Benaniah took his place as the commander of the army. So he did rise to that top level, not because he sought it, but because he lived with integrity and served with integrity. See, David trusted Benaniah with his life. And then when Benaniah became the servant for Solomon, Solomon treated him the same way. Because for years, Benaniah lived in a way that showed David he could be trusted, that he could be loved, and that he could be valued. He was captain of the bodyguard for years. And the bodyguards, the secret service, don't get the headlines. It's the president that gets the headlines. Good or bad, the president is the one that we remember. We don't remember the secret service. And when we look at the mighty men, many of the mighty men were not upstanding citizens. There were some scoundrels. There were some outcasts. But Ben and I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a righteous individual. His father was a priest. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it shows that he was raised in a way that pointed him to God. In fact, his name means he whom Jehovah has built. And I would argue his entire life was focused on being faithful to who God is in his life. And he had abilities, and those abilities provided opportunities, but it was his character that determined success. But above all else, we see that Ben and I did not worry about getting the attention. He didn't worry about achieving a certain rank or getting to a certain height in his notoriety. He realized that it was not his responsibility to get the headlines. It was his responsibility to serve the king. And I hope we see the correlation of that. It's not your responsibility to get the headlines. It's not your responsibility to be noticed. It's not your responsibility to be famous. It's your responsibility to serve the king that is Jesus Christ. That is our mission. So you can go home today. You can go to work this week. You can go to the park. You can go to the grocery store. And whatever you're doing, it's your responsibility to do those things as though you are working for Jesus, not for your own personal ambition, not just so you can have a better life, but so you can honor Jesus. That's our mission. That's our goal. It's important that we work on our skills and improve ourselves, but it's more important that we live a life with integrity for Jesus Christ. If we don't do that, then our skills, our ability mean nothing. But if we live our life for Jesus Christ, then he can use our skills and ability for his glory. It's not your job to get the headlines. It's your job to serve the king. And I hope you live that way. We're going to sing a closing song today. And as the musicians come forward, I just want to encourage you to think through the things in your life of how can I live my life in a way that shows Jesus that I'm loyal to him, that I'm going to serve him with integrity, that it's not about me, that it's not about my ability, it's not about my skills, it's about how I can honor Jesus with all that I do. So let's stand as we sing.